Library and I am on a Friday field trip again and today I am at the Carlisle Reservation. Uh, specifically we are at the Raptor Center of the Carlisle Reservation and I am here with Mary and she is going to talk to us about the raptors here and why they are here and maybe we'll even get to meet one. So. Hello, Mary. Thank you for Hi, inviting us. Well, thanks for coming. Um, yes, welcome to Carlisle Reservation. This is um, part of Lorain County Metro Parks. It's kind of the central hub, our largest reservation. And here we also have the Raptor Center. Uh, currently, we have six residents, and all of them have some sort of permanent injury that they can't be released out into the wild. So um, some of them have wing injuries. Uh, we have one that has an eye injury, and we have two that are imprinted that in that crucial time of development they uh, learn from humans that humans equal food and not how to be a wild bird which is not useful um, you know to, to survive out in the wild they don't have any fear of humans that's our barn owl and our turkey vulture so um, all of them have some sort of uh, disability like I said some sort of limitation um, whether it's you know, more mental or, or physical that they can't be uh, released and survive out in nature. So we give them a permanent home here. Oh. So who is this handsome fellow? So this is Luke. Um, Luke is our red-tailed hawk. Uh, I know he doesn't look like a regular red-tailed hawk, and that's because he actually has a genetic mutation called leucism, um, which affects all the pigments in his body, not just melanin. And it, we usually are more uh, familiar with albinism and having an albino animal and that just affects the melanin in the body which would in turn affect the melanin in his eyes which would turn his eyes pink and you can see he has those beautiful brown eyes that red tails have which means that it's a different genetic mutation called leucism. Um, but Luke here, uh, he has a wing injury and you can see the wing that's closest to me on this side here kind of, it doesn't fold right um, so he had an injury there and then he actually had a he broken again um, and so it had healed once out in the wild then the second time he got to a licensed wildlife rehabilitator that um, you know healed the wings so the the fractures healed but he can't fly because he doesn't have a lot of mobility in that wing which is why he lives with us here. So when a raptor like this when he gets a booboo -boo wing mm -hmm. um, how does he get from being in the wild to being here like do does animal control contact you or how how do the raptors wind up here so it's it it can be a couple different ways but more or less what happens is that um, somebody finds an injured animal whether it's Sometimes they're driving and they find it on the side of the road. Sometimes it lands at their yard. Um, you know, lots of different ways. Sometimes at their business. And they will, in a, you know, streamlined, they'll call a licensed wildlife rehabilitator. So in our area, um, that's the Lake Erie Nature and Science Center in Bay Village, uh, the Medina Raptor Center in Spencer, um, and also back to the wild in Castalia. So those are the only three places um, in our area that have the permits and the knowledge to take in an injured bird and hopefully, or other animal, um, and then hopefully rehabilitate it to the point where it can be released back out into nature. Um, so for the Metro Parks, we don't have those rehab permits, we have education permits. So after an animal has gone through that process and it has been deemed non-releasable by an avian vet, then um, they look for the right kind of home, the permanent forever home for that animal. And that's where we come in as a facility that houses those animals that can't be released, excuse me, to use them for education purposes. Um, that's, you know, that's our piece of the puzzle. And once they live here, they're just like totally cool hanging out with humans? Um, well, that's yes and no. Um, we work really hard on that relationship with our birds um, to make sure that uh, we do have that positive relationship. And we, we think of it as like a trust account. So the more we put into that trust account, sometimes if you have to... Uh, go to the vet for a visit or um, get your talons trimmed or your beak trimmed, then it doesn't bankrupt that trust. So we work on that every single day with all the birds, whether they're birds that come out on the glove or whether they're birds that are on display here. Um, each one of those we work towards that goal. Um, and it also depends on finding the right bird for the situation. So not every bird that's eligible to place 
is the right bird for this facility because we're right next to a parking lot. We have some of our major events come coming at Carlisle, um, like Halloween Fair and you know maple sugaring and some of the other things. So um, not every bird that has in, has been injured um, would be able to uh, acclimate successfully, and we want them to be successful and and happy and healthy for the rest of their life. So um, and that's why sometimes. Um, we have empty enclosures because we're looking for that right fit um, that's good for the bird and then also good for us. Um, so it, it can take a little bit of time. But once you get the right bird, then then you have uh, birds that are comfortable and happy like this. Just watching us talk right in front of them. When you know, if this was a bird out in the wild, a, a wild red tail um, that didn't have any interaction with people, this this would not be comfortable for that bird. So I don't see anybody in here. Is this an empty enclosure? It isn't. Um, so the bird that's in here is actually an eastern screech owl, and they're only about this big. And he's really great at camouflage. So if you look up in the corner here on one of these grapevine perches, you can see him just mm -hmm. tucked back. Yeah, so for owls, since they uh, rely on their camouflage a lot, and, and most of them, like an eastern screech owl, live in forested areas where they have um, a lot of places where they can tuck in and hide and feel safe during the day, we try and mimic that in their enclosures. Um, you know, not so much that nobody can see them, but so that they can feel comfortable. So that's why we have these, these leaves here, um, and we have these perches that are kind of high and tucked against the wall, so that way he has a place where he can see everything going on and check out all the people, um, but he can also feel safe and protected. during the day, but they also kind of catnap, so they're aware of what's going on, just in, in order to keep them safe. Um, but for owls, what you're actually seeing is him uh, doing the bird version of squinting. So it's it's kind of sunny right now, and they don't wear sunglasses or hats or visors or anything like that. So what happens is they'll actually close their eyes to help. Um, but it can also be a camouflage thing. So if you notice, now that he has his eyes closed, closed, um, that he has feathers on his eyelids, and that actually helps them camouflage a little bit more because in the context of the forest, those feathers and that camouflage, the only thing that might give it away would be those nice, golden, beautiful eyes that he has. And if you can't see them, then, then it's really hard to see the actual bird. And why is he living here at the Raptor Center? Um, he actually has an eye injury, so this is our bird that is blind in the eye, so it's actually his left eye, and the pupil, so the black middle part is actually um, so big, his eye just looks totally black. So he has one eye that's shaped normally, and then the other eye isn't, so um, he's actually been here for, um, let's see, he came in as a fledgling in 2005, so he's actually been here for quite some time. How long do they live? <laughs> well... In the wilds, they live to be about 12 years old. So if you do the math, um, he is well past that. Um, and he's actually our bird that, you know, as birds get older, and obviously the vet comes out every year, that's part of the reason between that and their medicine, and um, they get vitamins mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, any uh, prescription meds that they need. Everybody gets a West Nile vaccination. Um, so that's part of the reason why we're fortunate that they live longer than than their natural lifespan. Um, but he is our bird that we've been watching and is on a couple medications to keep him healthy um, that we uh, you know, work closely with their avian vet when they, when they get a little bit older and, and more of a special, special case. So it's a little hard to see up there, but who is that up there in the bird factors? Yeah, so that is He's one of our two barred owls, B-A-R-R-E-D, um, not to be confused with barn owls. And this is his favorite hiding spot. So he has these wood slats, just kind of like we were talking with Smokey the Eastern Screech Owl. Um, we give them places where they can feel protected, but they can also see what's going on with everybody. And um, it's, it's pretty cool that he has a, a hiding spot that's really close because then people can get close to him. And once you know the secret, then you can see him every time you come visit. Um, so that is, is his favorite spot. So he's not there quite 
history that they do out in the wild. We try and mimic that if we can um, inside their enclosure. So um, we have Stuart. He's actually been here since 2007. He has a wing injury um, and he actually comes from Kentucky. Um, you know, just because when you start to place birds, the right fit, the right bird, the right location, um, sometimes that net gets wider and wider and wider. Um, when you have the the, the space and, and looking for the right bird at the right time. Uh, and we also have another bird here. This is our other barred owl. And her favorite hiding spot is just all the way back in, in the back there, tucked. There's a, a, a perch there that, you know, you should come and visit in person and be able to see her. Um, the Rampers Center is open 8 to 4.30 every day. But um, this bird is, is younger, and you know, just before I tell you her, her history, these two enclosures are a little bit darker on purpose, um, just because for barred owls and talking about them not being necessarily active during the day, um, we just try and mimic that so they can feel a little bit more comfortable in their enclosures, and so that people can see them without them being panicked, because both of these birds, as um, parent-reared owls, are, are not necessarily the ones that become very comfortable in the care of people, so they are, are display birds, um, which is why we um, give them some of these nice spaces, and you're not gonna see them on the glove on a program. But Olivia here, she is in the back um, on that, on her favorite perch, and she is actually newer to the Raptor Center. She came in in the fall of 2019 from the Medina Raptor Center, and um, she actually has a, not that any of them have necessarily like happy stories, even though we're happy that they have a permanent home. Um, they, she was actually found um, in somebody's front yard and uh, there was somebody, a volunteer from the Dino Raptor Center was walking by and sees this owl in distress and went to go take it to the facility. And the person whose yard it was said, oh, that's my friend owl, I'm taking it for a walk. Um, and it turned out that this, this person had this owl in a wire cage in his basement and uh, who knows for how long, it wasn't very clear and so obviously that is, we don't, as much as some of us would love to live in the Harry Potter world, we don't actually. So um, to have an owl in a wire cage in your basement is not the proper housing, you're not getting the proper food. Um, and so long story short, that bird was taken to the Dino Raptor Center, and it has wing injuries on its on the very very end wing tip, so that it doesn't um, she doesn't have full flight capabilities, and so she couldn't be released back out into the wild. So it was a perfectly healthy bird that, because of that improper housing, got these injuries and now can't be released back out into nature. So, which is which is why she's here, and which is why. Some of that education about raptors and what to do, what not to. If you find an injured bird, you know, here's where to take it. Um, you know, not taking in injured animals in your house, even though very well intentioned, um, may not end up well for that animal long term. And there's lots of people in our area that have that skill set that can help that animal and really it back out into nature. So that's part of the reason why we're driven to do our education piece so that that doesn't happen to another animal in the future. Changing the subject a little okay, bit. Okay, sure. Um, who gets to name the raptors? Um, well, it's, most of the time it's it's staff, so staff perks. So uh, sometimes they have names. Sometimes it's our, our group of volunteers um, that we that we kind of collectively decide to name a bird a certain name. So. Like the, the Raptor Corps volunteers um, in 2019, we named Olivia together. Um, and then Luke came in with his name. Uh, Smokey, I think, came in with his name. But then the staff led, you know, we're like, well, we could name this bird Artemis, or we can name it something else. So um, I, that was one that, that we kind of came up with in Olivia as well. So it's just kind of a mix mash. Um, of, of people, it's just kind of like, 
you know, when you see a, a baby, you're like, oh, well, this is the right name for this for this human. This is the right name for this bird. But it's not like they come to the names. It's not like they know what their names are. So it's just for us as humans, for fun. It's not necessarily for the birds for any kind of training purpose. So, so who is this? So this is Artemis. He is the turkey vulture that we have here. He has been here um, since 2010, and he actually came in as a young bird. So he is 11 years old this year, and he is imprinted. So um, when he was two or three days old, he landed into, it's actually the Lake Metro Parks um, Wildlife Rehabilitation Center, and he was dehydrated, he was covered in maggots, he was, you know, just needed assistance. So. Um, they got him fixed up pretty quickly, went to go take him to the nest. And a cool fun fact about vultures, um, cool fun thing about vultures is that they're actually North America's largest cavity nester. And because think about it, have you ever really seen a vulture nest? No. Right. We have. Um, so they could be sometimes in abandoned buildings, um, sometimes they're in holes in trees, um, they, they're lots of different places on the ground, sometimes in, in, you know, like I said, trees, barn lofts, lots of different places um, that turkey vultures will nest. So you would think that being big birds would be very easy to find that nest, but since they're so secretive, it can be pretty difficult. And so they were never able, never able to find his original nest, and then they tried to put him in a surrogate nest, and um, that didn't work because the family rejected the, this new mouse to feed. And um, so all the time he was learning, uh, you know, from the humans that were taking care of him, humans equal food. Vultures are very smart animals. And so all that time he was missing out on all the wild turkey vulture lessons mm -hmm. and was learning that humans equal food and something not to be scared of. So um, he actually then at that point wasn't able to be released. And you can see even now, you can see how um, you know, just kind of preening, which is a level, showing a level of comfort. Um, he's trying to be as close to the humans as he possibly can and just wants to see what's going on. Um, you know, none of that would be safe if this was a wild vulture because you just want to hang out with the humans and see what you're doing all the time. So, so since he can't come out and because like everybody passes by the road and they see the vultures mm -hmm. munching on the side of the road, since he can't do that, how does he eat? Um, well, we uh, feed him just like any of the other birds, which I think we're going to get to in a little bit, yes? Yes. Okay. Um, and so we feed him, you know, fresh rats, mice, chicks, liver, pinky mice, any of those things. Um, none of the birds here get live food, uh, just because if they already have injuries that they wouldn't be able to hunt successfully in the wild in this nice open space, they're not going to be able to hunt successfully in an enclosed space. Um, so he, just like any, any other bird, we, it's based on his weight and his, and what he's, um, how he's acting, his behavior. So he's telling us how much food he needs or doesn't need. Um, just, you know, kind of like humans do. Mm -hmm. And so we give him food every day and then, you know, weigh it, what goes in and what comes out, um, what he eats, what he doesn't eat, and by his weight. Yeah. Okay. So where are we now? Okay, so welcome to the inside, behind the scenes piece of the Raptor Center. Um, so this is the room where we spend most of our time, and this is the table that we spend most of our time at. Um, this is where we prep all of the food um, and we uh, get everything set and ready to go for the day for the birds. And then at the end of the day, we figure out what they don't eat and uh, record that as well on our feeding chart. So each one of the birds has their own little um, line for the week. Mm -hmm. And then we record what they eat or what their food given, what they ate. Um, and their weight, if we, if we weigh them during the day, so a filled out chart might look like this. Okay. So that way we have a good working knowledge of um, what happened that week, and that way that determines, for me, as the um, Indian program curator, one of the things that I do is I will adjust their food based on their behavior, based on their weight, 
based on the weather, based on all sorts of things. Um, and so we've got this food guidelines chart up here that you can see it's in pencil and I've erased and then rewritten and then erased and then rewritten um, sometimes a couple times a, a week, um, just depending on what's, what's going on with, with the birds, just to make sure that we're giving them as much accurate information and food as we um, can. So this is also the place, obviously this is where we prep all the food, so anybody that has medicine, like um, you can see that uh, Smokey the Eastern Screech Owl, after our vet visit last week, just got a new medication in his food um, that, that we add. So uh, this is the note to say, put it, in there. Right, put it in there, we have a new medication. So um, I do have our, for all of our owls, so that's Olivia Stewart's Smokey Luna, um, I have their food, which I'll, I'll show you how to prep in a little bit, but we do actually pre-portion our food bags here so that all these mice and this one rat, um, all of this is for um, the owls for today. So this is the food for today. Um, the diurnals or daytime active birds, uh, Luke the red-tailed hawk and Artemis the turkey vulture, they've already gotten their food um, portioned out this morning. Um, and uh, in the case of Artemis, he's already snapped on some. So um, there's that, but where all the rest of the food comes from, back behind here, fridge, we've got our food that's either prepped, so we've got food that's thawing for the next day, because it's always all about food all the time. Do we have enough food for today? Have we prepped it for tomorrow? Is it being thawed properly? Do we have the food in the fridge for later today? What time? So it, there's a lot of timing things that go along with that as well, so our day is pretty structured in terms of which birds get which food at what time. Mm -hmm. And um, then, of course, because this is the safest and cleanest spot in the Raptor Center, um, this is where we keep our supplements for the birds and then our prescription medications that we get from our um, animal clinic. So we actually are uh, patients at the Animal Clinic Northview. Dr. Lindstrom is our avian vet. And um, so all of our, our um, prescription medications come from that facility. Where do the rats and mice come from? You don't have to like go out and search for them yourself, do you? We do not, and um, part of that is because if you had mice and rats that you just took out from the wild or roadkill or whatever, um, unfortunately a lot of people still use pesticides, rodenticides, and, and like decon ways to kill animals with poison and unfortunately that can get into the food chain. I mean I myself have seen, you know, because sometimes even though we don't have wildlife rehabilitation permits, um, I on a rare occasion will help somebody, you know, either on my own time or, you know, whatever, um, get a bird safely to the wildlife rehabilitator if it might be a safety issue for somebody or that bird, um, if, if we're able to. And um, I've seen a number of birds that have lead poisoning or rat poisoning or you know, something like that. So um, that's a long way of saying um, we don't take animals from the wild. Uh, we actually had a place that donated mice and rats, which I know sounds very strange, um, but there is a, a one facility and then another facility in Michigan that um, were in contact with places that bred mice and rats for labs, for colleges, and you know other other businesses. And um, the extras, because they breed like mice and rats, um, were euthanized and then donated as food sources to wildlife rehabilitators or educators like us. Um, and we still have some, but all of those donated food sources have dried up, so now we actually purchase all of our food. Um, and it gets purchased through a, a real website called rodentpro.com. And uh, it is, you know, it's, it's pretty expensive. It costs about $25 a day to feed all of our birds, and that's with the medications and supplements and all that other stuff added in. And um, <clears throat> that's why we have our adopt a raptor program because those funds fund the food donation, um, you know, and those, part of it is for the medical bills, um, for, you know, all the vet costs, all the prescription medications, all the supplements, and then also the food. So that's, that's what those funds are for, is to in turn buy safe food that we can um, give to our birds. Okay. How do you enroll in adopt a raptor? 
Um, you can enroll, there is a paper form either at the front desk here or out at the Raptor Center. Um, there is, you can download the form on our website, which is LorainCountyMetroParks.com. Um, the Raptor Center has a web page part of that, so you can just search or it's under the Facilities tab, Raptor Center. Um, there's also, on our website, there's also an online donation platform if you prefer to do it that way. Um, we also have an Amazon wish list because, you know, that frees up that donation money when we, we get stuff and things. So the stuff and things might be um, AstroTurf or um, uh, heated pads, heated perches, uh, things that we need for the birds that um, people may not necessarily think about, screws, uh, just it's a, a kitchen shears. It is a lot of random stuff on that because it's just the random pieces, parts that that help round out um, the care for the birds at the Raptor Center. Yep. So this is Luna. Um, Luna is one of our wildlife program ambassadors. She's a barn owl, and um, she is actually our newest resident here at the Raptor Center. She is just over a year old. And so she's still learning how things go, checking out everything on this windy day. Um, can be a little intense for, for raptors and, and owls in, in particular to be out in this open space. But um, that's why I've got my, my niece's pieces here, the, the little um, food that we prepped earlier inside the, the raptor center there. And um, she is, again, a, a barn owl. She is imprinted, so you can see her her interest isn't necessarily in me, the human that is super close to this bird. And I also work really hard with that, that relationship with her um, to make sure that we can, we can do this and, and be true working partners in our, in our programs um, here at the Visitor Center. So how do you get them to come down onto your glove? Well, with a lot of patience, um, uh, we use a, a kind of training that's uh, positive reinforcement training, which just means that um, that we don't force them to do something um, when we ask them to. And if she doesn't want to come down on the glove, then we just say, okay, we just come back later. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, she, we, we work a lot with using her food as, as uh, pieces. Um, we don't withhold food, you know, we don't starve her so that she works. It's, it, the food we always offer it and it's always available for her um, to do to do um, different simple behaviors. Mm -hmm. But it's also the weather, like especially since she's a younger bird, and um, because this is her first true summer where she's not growing in all of her flight feathers and and all the things that um, she's not, there's some days where. She just, I mean, even if you just free fed her, just like, here, here's all the mice that you want. She just, she won't eat them all because um, she's still kind of metabolized wise, still trying to figure all that out. Did you ever try to fly off? Um, she does. So in this kind of scenario being out here, um, I do have these, uh, these paracord jesses through those leather anklets and that's connected to me. Um, just because if she did fly off in this scenario, um, that could be really dangerous for her um, because we, you know, she doesn't, oh, yeah, she might, because there's people coming up here. Yeah. Sorry, I just, I know, I realized I just stopped right in the middle of what I was saying, but, um, <clears throat> So, you know, we don't want her to fly off here because, you know, we want to keep her safe. Remember that she's here for a reason, and the reason is because she wouldn't be able to survive out in nature um, without, you know, without humans because she doesn't know how to be a wild barn owl. I don't know. So, um, you know, that's why we have her as, as a wildlife program ambassador, and that's why we keep, kind of keep her um, secure when she's outside. But if she's back in her enclosure, she could just fly away from us at any time. We don't we don't have her just up. We don't force her to get on the scale. We ask her to get on the scale. So that's, she isn't, that's kind of how that works. She doesn't like her friend. She doesn't have any wing in, injuries or anything like that. Correct. Correct. She does not have, she's physically fine. It's just um, she missed out on learning how to be a wild barn owl, which is, you know, why she's in the, why she's in the care of people. And you can see mouse heads are her <clears throat> her go-to favorite. I know that's not <clears throat> maybe our preferred snack, but it certainly is hers. 
very beautiful. Yeah, and you can see that white facial disc. Um, you know, all owls have really sensitive hearing, <clears throat> and that's part of the reason why she's so interested in being out here because there's so many noises, things that we're hearing, but also a lot of things that we're not hearing and we're not picking up. Um, and that facial disc actually helps, it's like a giant satellite, and it helps funnel sound to her ears. And there's been studies where um, even in complete darkness, barn owls can locate their prey <clears throat> um, just by using their hearing. So anybody can come visit Luna, right? Not necessarily out on the glove, but... Right, so the Raptor Center courtyard is open 8 to 4.30 every day, <clears throat> except for major holidays. And um, it's free admission, um, you know, come in any time. We do have programs set through the summer, Wildlife Up Close, which is here in the amphitheater every Sunday, 2 to 3, from now until uh, September 5th. Um, it's a mix, so sometimes it's, sometimes it's a bird. Um, a lot of times it's uh, the reptiles inside, or it's a combination of, of both those things. But it's uh, some program on native wildlife, and none of the two are the exact same. So um, even if you've gone to one, you can certainly come back to another one and um, you know see some more uh, native wildlife, learn about um, a different animal up close, and see the wildlife program ambassadors in this nice outdoor amphitheater. It's awesome. Thank you so much for inviting us over. Yes, thank you for coming. And I'm glad you're able to meet Luna and all the other birds and, and see what they eat every day. You can see how much she loves it. Yes, I'm <laughs> glad all that hard work paid off. Okay, so once again, I'm Carrie. I'm with the Illyria Library. This is Mary and Luna. They're with the Carlisle Reservation. And this was a Friday field trip.